Well, here I am in my usual place, but where are you? Ah, I forgot. You're at home, you're on the couch, you're sitting there with a nice coffee in your hand. And some of you, like Butch, even in bed on a Sunday morning, but that's good, that's good. Let me share a secret with you. I'm recording this for you today, but on Sunday morning, I'll be in my bed with a family around there. We've got a couch on the one side and the kids on the couch and Liesl and I and probably the poodles on the bed and we'll be watching this together with you. But it's really a privilege to be able to share God's word and to have technology to be able to do this. I'm just so grateful for that. Um, I think we do church great when we do it in this place and there are a couple of thousand people but we've been doing it well on YouTube. You know, it's just been amazing. Uh, we've had more viewers. We've had more people following than ever before. And so it's really been very special. I also want to give you some feedback uh, just on the food that we've been distributing during this time. I wish we could take a picture of the foyer with all the food together, but as it comes in, we're letting it go out, and, and so we've probably distributed tons of food at this time, really just helping people in need, and so I want to take this opportunity this morning just to thank you for your extremely generous giving, and also for your tithing during this time. I really want to thank you for that, and so as a team, as pastors, We've been praying for you, and we've really been praying God's word, His promise over you that God says if we return the tithe to the storehouse, He'll open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that we won't have room to contain it. And so we've been praying that. We've been saying, God, that's your word. You've promised that. And so as people are just giving and just being faithful, we pray that you will bless them indeed. And of course, when God blesses us, it's not just financially, but it's in every other area of our lives. I want to share God's word, and I want to just remind you, today, of course, is the National Day of Prayer. And so I'm going to lead us in prayer right at the end. But the word that I want to share with you this morning is about our emotions. You know, I've noticed during this lockdown time how people protect themselves physically. They wear masks and sometimes even gloves and and their social distancing, and they use sanitizers and, and all of that. They protect themselves physically. But here's the thing. Sometimes we don't protect ourselves emotionally. And God has made us not only physical beings, but he's made us body, soul, and spirit. And of course, the body is the physical side. The spirit, the spiritual side. And then the emotions, that's our soul. And so God has made every single one of us an emotional being as well. And notice I didn't only say the ladies. God hasn't only made ladies emotional, but he's made all of us. We tend to think ladies are more emotional. Not quite true. Ladies just show more emotion than men. Men hide emotions more than ladies let me tell you a story quickly, true story. I met with this couple who lost their son. The mother was going through a very difficult time, just broken and, and really battling. And so I sat with them as a couple and we talked through it. And initially it looked like the father was handling it pretty well. But what I soon realized is that he was just suppressing his emotions. And so initially he didn't even want to talk about his emotions at all. But as time went by and the more he shared, the more we realized that he was going through the same stuff that she was going through. He was battling with the same emotions, but he'd just been suppressing it. He'd been hiding it. You see, uh, women show their emotions. Men generally tend to hide their emotions. And so we all have emotions. God has made us like that. And so today I want to talk about dealing with our emotions, correcting our emotions, and how our emotions affect our daily lives. Now there's seven basic emotions. You don't need to write this down. It's really not important. I'm just mentioning it. The seven basic emotions are these. Anger, fear, disgust, happiness, sadness, 
surprise, and contempt. But for today's talk, I just want to focus on the positive side of our emotions and the negative side of our emotions and have a look at that. And why do we, why do we look at emotions today? It's because everything hinges on our emotions. Our joy, our peace, our happiness, our relationships flow from that. Even the way we progress in life, everything flows, or can I say hinges, on our emotions. And so it's our emotions that form the basis or the foundation of our actions. It starts with a thought, moves to an emotion, and then it moves on to an action. And so all of our actions basically hinge on our emotions. During this lockdown time that I've often heard people say, oh, these are, these are unprecedented times that we're facing. And every time I hear them say that, you know, it's almost like something rises on the inside. And I think, no, man, that's nonsense. That's not true. Because the world has gone through stuff like this before. We faced many other pandemics and we faced it and went through it and come through it on the other side and life continued. But it's almost like every time they say that, it stirs up certain emotions on the inside. And unfortunately, these aren't positive emotions. It stirs up a bit of fear and anxiety because these are unprecedented times. There's no precedent for what we're going through. And it's not true. I think of one pandemic, for instance, in 1854, the cholera pandemic in London. It's where the water was contaminated. And so people were dying like flies, really. It was very, very bad. But do you know, since then, we've had seven cholera pandemics in the last 200 years. Just cholera, not even other pandemics. Just cholera pandemics, we've had seven in the last 200 years. And the last one was in 2016, 17, 18, even 19, in those years in Yemen. And so all I'm saying is we've been through it before, and we'll probably go through something like this again in the future. And here's the thing. We've got to be very careful how we think during this time. Because when we go around thinking, oh, this is terrible, and we've never been through something like this before, and we don't know how we're going to handle it, and we start thinking thoughts like this, those thoughts are going to establish certain emotions on the inside. And I can tell you, they aren't positive emotions at all. You see, if a certain thought persists, it creates a certain emotion on the inside. And so when you think helpless, hopeless thoughts, you start creating a certain emotion. When you think negative thoughts, you create negative emotions. And eventually those emotions will lead to certain actions. So let me give you an example. You start thinking, I'm not good enough and I don't really have what it takes. And people don't really enjoy spending time with me and I don't have too much to offer. You think thoughts like that? You're going to have emotions of inferiority. You're going to have negative emotions. And eventually those emotions are going to cause you to act in an insecure and unconfident way around people. And so we always move from thought to emotion to action. That's how it works. And so we may think it's okay to just have a few negative thoughts now and again. It, it's not a big deal. Oh, it is a big deal. Because those thoughts are going to create certain emotions. And here's the thing. Thoughts are temporary. Thoughts are quick. You have a thought and you move on. But unfortunately, emotions aren't. Emotions stay there for quite a while. And it affects our lives. It affects our joy and our relationships and our progress. And it affects so much of our lives. It's so easy for you and me to feel negative emotions. All you've got to do is wake up in the morning and think, you know what, I'm just... 
I'm done with this. I'm done with this lockdown. I just can't do this anymore. I'm just, I'm just sick and tired. And what's happening is you're busy fueling those negative emotions on the inside. And, and before you know it, you're frustrated and you're irritated and you, you've just had enough. And you know what? You've brought that on yourself. We fuel our emotions through our thoughts. And if it's the wrong thoughts, we feel the wrong emotions. And we bring that on ourselves. And the question we've got to ask ourselves, do those wrong emotions, do they help us or hinder us? Do they make us better people? Do they help the other people around about us in our lives? And the answer is no, no. <laughs> Negative emotions don't help us nor the people in our lives one single bit. And so one of the areas I've found that's the most affected by our emotions is our level of joy. Our joy is affected. And so you'll find people today walking around almost under a cloud. They worried about the future. They're concerned about what life is going to look like because everybody is saying, you know, life is going to change and there's going to be change and things are going to be different. And they're walking around thinking, I wonder what's going to change and how it's going to change and, and how is this change going to affect me? And, and am I still going to be able to do this? And am I still going to be able to do that? And, and so what's happening is all of these thoughts are affecting our emotions and ultimately affecting our joy. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Be joyful always. Now listen to this. And then it says, Pray continually. Let's just pause there for a moment. How do those two go together? Be joyful. Pray. Why pray? Because you may have some challenges. You may have some things you're concerned about. And so choose joy, be joyful. And in the midst of that, come on. If you've got to pray, bring it before the Lord, but be joyful. If you're concerned about something, that's fine. Pray, but be joyful. And so scripture tells us, be joyful always. Pray continually. And then here's another key. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now listen to this. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Notice how it says it's God's will. You see, God doesn't want you and me to walk around with heavy emotions and to be down and discouraged. And God doesn't want that. And so I found in my own life, let me just share something with you for myself. I found it extremely empowering to remind myself on a regular basis, negative emotions are not part of God's will for my life. And so every now and again, if it just feels slightly heavy, I just remind myself, this is not God's will for my life. God doesn't want me to live like that. Because you see, let me say to you, and I'm going to show you from Scripture in a moment, where God actually wants us to live the opposite. Where God wants us to have an abundance of joy in our lives. Listen to what Jesus said. And I'm going to give you three verses here quickly. The first one in John 15. Jesus says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Another translation says that it may be full, that your joy may be full, may be overflowing. In John 16, 24, it says, ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. John 17, 13. So that they may have the full measure, the full measure of my joy within them. I don't know if you've ever seen it like this. But God doesn't want you and me to just have a little bit of joy. But to have the full measure. Almost like joy just overflowing. Why? Because Jesus had the full measure of joy. Do you know scripture tells us that Jesus had more joy than anybody else around him? Listen to what scripture says here in Hebrews chapter 1. It says, God has set you, and it's referring to Jesus, above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And so you could say, 
His joy, Jesus' joy was just on another level. And so if you see a picture of Jesus without a smile on his face, it's probably not accurate. If you see footage depicting Jesus in a movie or something like that or a series like the series that's on at the moment and he's not smiling, it's probably not accurate. I think the two times Jesus wasn't smiling was probably we overturned the tables and then the other time where he's hanging on the cross. But I think in, in between those times, you probably saw Jesus 99% of the time just with abundant joy, just with this incredible smile. And that's how God wants us to live. He wants us to have that same kind of joy. I want to say it again. I want to remind you today that negative emotions are not God's will for your life. It's not His will for your life, nor for my life. Now, living a life that's full of joy is not connected to your circumstances. Or let me say it's not determined by your circumstances. So it doesn't mean that your life has got to be perfect and without problems. It also doesn't mean that your life has got to be great. It simply means that our God is great and that he has great plans for our lives. And so I don't look at my circumstances because maybe they aren't great, but my God is great and I know he's got great plans for my life. And so the more I focus on those things, man, the more I just have joy on the inside. And so I find joy is simply the fruit of an unshakable belief in the nature and the character of God. It's the fruit of an unshakable belief in the nature and character of God. Not our circumstances. These things come and go and they change, but God never changes. So the question is, where do our negative emotions, where do they come from? We've seen the first thing is our thoughts, starts with our thoughts, leads to emotions, and eventually to action. So it starts with thoughts. But there are two other things where negative emotions come from. Shock and loss. Shock and loss. Whenever we face some kind of shock or some kind of loss, it creates some negative emotions on the inside. And if you think about it, COVID-19 has caused or produced both of those things in our lives, shock and loss. I mean, before COVID-19, we were living our lives and we were planning and doing this and doing that. We were going on. And the next moment, it's almost like life just was, was paused, like the pause button has been hit. And life just suddenly stands still. And all the plans and everything that we were busy with is just abruptly came to a standstill. The whole world came to a standstill. And what happens? It causes shock. We all in some form of shock because of that. What about loss? Well, I think we've all gone through some form of loss. And it could be something as simple as you've lost a birthday. <laughs> you had a birthday in this time and, and you couldn't celebrate with friends and family as you would normally do. Or maybe you were planning a wedding and it had to be put off or postponed. You've lost that. Or you planned an overseas trip. Or you planned a holiday or something like that. And maybe you've lost that. Maybe you've lost a deal or a contract and you were busy with that and it was on the cards and, and it's almost like it slipped through your fingers now. You've lost that. Or even worse, you've lost a job or a business during this time. Or maybe even a loved one. Whenever you and I go through some kind of loss or some kind of shock, it causes sorrow in our lives. And sorrow is a negative emotion, but this is what I want you to see. It's a normal, natural emotion. There's nothing wrong with sorrow. Even Jesus had some sorrow. Remember when he lost a friend, when he lost Lazarus? The Bible says, and this is the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. That's in the King James Bible. Jesus wept. 
And so even Jesus had sorrow. And so it's not wrong. It's okay to be sorrowful. But it's dangerous to get stuck in sorrow. It's dangerous to allow sorrow to overwhelm you. So how do we ensure that we don't get stuck in sorrow and in negative emotions? I want to share two things with you, two strategies, as it were, simple steps from the Bible. And the first one is to recognize it. You see, I think unless you recognize it, you can't do something about it. And so we've got to recognize it. And for us as guys, this is a little bit difficult because we tend to hide it. Oh, it's fine. I'm okay. Nothing wrong. But meanwhile, on the inside, I'm... I'm not that good. I'm not that lacquer. All right? And so we've got to learn to recognize it. And then secondly, we've got to learn to rectify it. Recognize it. Rectify it. And I want to show us quickly one of the greatest men in the Bible, one of the greatest kings, one of the greatest warriors, fighters, a real man's man, King David. He did this. And he had no problem in recognizing it. When he was heavy, when he was down, he's like, okay, what's happening here? I'm not good. He was big enough to recognize it. Let me read it to you quickly. And I read from Psalm 42. David says, why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Notice what he's doing. He's recognizing something is not good. And then he says, then he says, And he's talking to himself, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. What is he doing? He's rectifying it. He's turning to God and he starts praising God and he realizes, you are my God. You are my Savior. You on my side. You see those two things that he does? He recognizes, man, I'm heavy, I'm down. But I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to rectify it. And the way he did it was to turn to God. Now, we've just read from Psalm 42. Do you know Psalm 42 verse 5? Do you know in Psalm 43 verse 5, it says exactly the same thing. He just repeats that. He says, why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? He recognizes. Now he rectifies. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, And my God. So the question is, how do we rectify it? I've just shown you what David did, what worked for David. Because you see, we've all got to find something that works for us. And we we wire it slightly differently. And one thing really works for you. Another thing may not work for you. And so you'll find for some people, for instance, when they down emotionally, They need sleep. And then for others, when they're down emotionally, they need to eat. And let me say to you, both of those are very biblical. When you go and have a look at 1 Kings, where Elisha, he runs away from Jezebel. He's just been on Mount Carmel, and now he runs away. And God makes him do two things. God feeds him in the desert under the broom tree. God feeds him, lets him sleep. Then an angel comes, wakes him up, says, eat some more, sleep some more. And so what happens is sometimes we need to rest physically in order to rest emotionally. And so for some people, they need sleep. Some people, they need to eat. Other people need to exercise. I'm one of those. When I carry a bit of load, I know exercise really helps me. It helps me to de-stress. Another thing that helps me is simply gratitude and thanksgiving. You know, when I start thanking God, and really that's what David did. He says, why are you so heavy? Why so downcast? He says, my hope is in God. I will yet praise him. And so what happens, I found the moment I just start thanking God for this and for that and for the next, and man, I spend a couple of moments thanking God and and my spirits are lifted just like that. So let me share two more things with you that may be able to help you just rectify some negative emotions. And here they are. Stay connected 
to his word and his people. Stay connected to his word and his people. I've found there are times when I feel a little bit heavy. And the moment I take God's word and I open his word and I start reading God's word, I'm telling you, within a couple of moments, my spirit is lifted and I just feel so much better. So for me, the two things that really help apart from exercise, that helps. But I found it's exercise, it's thanksgiving and gratitude and turning to God's word. Remember I told you about the cholera outbreak in 1854? Well, one of the pastors that was involved at that stage in London and looking after the people and ministering was a young, young pastor. He was 20 years old. And he would go on to become a world-famous pastor. He would later on be known as the Prince of Preachers. His name was Charles Spurgeon. And so Spurgeon would be called out daily to go and visit and pray and, and minister to dying people on their last. And so they would call him to this house and, and that house and the next house. At one stage... He was doing a funeral every single day. And so you can imagine, eventually, that just got the better of him. And he was so down and discouraged. Listen to what he said. He said, I became weary in body and sick in heart. He wasn't physically sick. He was emotionally sick. My friends seemed to fail one by one. And I felt that I was sickening like them. He was just emotionally drained. And so the one day he was walking down the street and he passed the shop and he saw this notice on the window right here next to him. And he stopped for a couple of moments to read it. It was Psalm 91. And so let me read to you quickly what he read. Just such a beautiful psalm and I know we've looked at it. Before, but I think it's so applicable. In verse 2, it says, He is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him, for He will rescue you from daily disease. He will cover you with His feathers, and He will shelter you with His wings. His promises are your armor and protection. If, listen to this, verse 9, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, in other words, if you'll turn to him, that's basically what it's saying. If you'll turn to him with your eyes on him, and your trust in him, and your confidence in him, if you turn to him, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me and I will protect those who trust in my name. And so Spurgeon tells how he stood there reading that on that shop window. And those couple of verses like that just completely flipped him around, instantly flipped him around. And he just realized he had allowed himself and allowed his emotions to get so down and so heavy because of everything happening around about him. And the moment he looked at scripture, everything changed. And so we've got to stay connected to God's word. But what about staying connected to God's people? Do you know psychologists tell us that the foundation of our emotions, please hear this. The foundation of our emotions are our relationships and our connectedness. The connections we have, the friends and, and the family. When we have strong connections, we have stronger emotions. And I think that's why when you and I go through a difficult time and uh, we're working through some problems and challenges in our lives what happens we very often we've got to speak to somebody we've just got to share and so we'll turn to a good godly friend somebody that we know somebody with wisdom or we'll turn to a pastor we'll turn to a counselor maybe because when you and I go through a difficult time when our emotions are down we're our own worst enemy 
Because that's when we don't make good decisions. And that's when we do stupid things, we say stupid things, because we're not thinking clearly. And the best thing we can do in times like that is to turn to somebody who's not emotionally as invested as what we are. And they are thinking clearly. And they have perspective. And they can help us through that. You see, the Bible says in Galatians 6 verse 2, it says, carry one another's burdens. There are times in your life and in my life where we carry burdens that we cannot carry alone. We weren't supposed to carry that alone. And that's why we need one another in our lives. I really believe we are smarter with other people. We are richer together with other people. We are wiser because of other people in our lives. Do you know that there are 59 one another scriptures in the New Testament alone, where it tells us love one another and honor one another, care for one another, serve, forgive, be patient, on and on and on it goes. God has created us to have one another's in our lives. We're not supposed to be doing life on our own. You know, the other day I was really just missing our team of pastors you know they've become like brothers to me and so I quickly arranged a zoom meeting and and when the meeting started I just said to them I said guys there's no agenda to this meeting because normally we'd have a little bit of an agenda a couple of things that we've got to discuss I said to them there's no agenda I said I just want us to chat and laugh and and just catch up and just enjoy one another and and so we were talking about what are you doing for dinner tonight and what are you doing and and we just had a great time and 30 minutes later I'm telling you when we ended that meeting I was just recharged I felt so much better why because we need godly people we need one another's in our lives Now, I know we can't come to church at the moment. I mean, what would it be like trying to have 50 people? I mean, we could probably have half of our staff and we'll have more than 50. So we can't do church and we can't really do small groups at the moment. But I want to say to you, you can still connect with the people in your small group. And all it takes is one single phone call to connect. And don't sit and wait for them to phone you and Feel sorry for yourself because nobody is phoned. No, no, no. You reach out to somebody in your small group and you phone them and you contact them and, and encourage them and, and lift their spirit. And I promise you, as you do that, you lift somebody else's spirit. Man, you put down that phone, you're going to find your own spirit is lifted and you're stronger emotionally when you do that. Do you know one of the main purposes of our small group, and you may not be aware of this, but one of our main purposes is family. You see, small groups aren't a meeting. Small groups have a meeting. Big difference. You see, the main thing is not the meeting. The main purpose is not the meeting or going through the notes and doing all of that. The main purpose of a small group is the people, is family, is connecting with one another because God has designed us to work like that. And so when we gather together like this, in this auditorium, we gather together with a couple of thousand at a time. It's a big gathering. And we love the big. It's incredible. It's wonderful. It's wow. It's a celebration. And I can't wait for us to get back to that. But we also need the small That small group, we need the big and we need the small, the family where we gather together. And listen to what the Bible says. And the Bible often likens it to a body and the different parts of the body that fit together and work together. Listen to Ephesians 4.16. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And so God has created us to be members of the body, to work together, grow together, love together, encourage one another. And I want to say to you, our emotional well-being, our emotions 
are stronger together with God's people than apart from God's people. So let me wrap it up for us this morning. Next time you see people protecting themselves physically, they've got a mask on and they're applying social distancing and sanitizing and those things are good. But let's not forget protecting ourselves emotionally. Our emotions are so important because everything flows out of our emotions. It forms the foundation from which we act. Starts with our thoughts and then moves to our emotions and eventually our actions flow out of that. So we've got to make sure that our emotions are healthy. It's God's will for us to not live with negative emotions. So I'm asking you today to do what David did. Two things. Recognize when your emotions are slightly down, slightly discouraged, and then rectify it. And I've given you quite a number of options, quite a number of things that you can do. You may have to sleep. You may have to eat. You may have to exercise. Or maybe, maybe you've got to praise God because that's probably one of the most powerful things. What about God's Word? Or God's people and just connecting with somebody. But you've got to find something that you can apply in your life that will lift your emotions. Now what I want to do is, seeing that today is, is our national day of prayer in South Africa. I want us to just pray together. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But before I do that, I want to read again just that a verse or two from Psalm 91. It's just, this is beautiful. Psalm 91 verse 9, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. Thank you, Lord. No plague will come near your home. Father, you are our refuge and our strength. You are our help in times of trouble. We declare that today. There's no ways we can try and sort this out on our own. We helpless without you, but we are not hopeless because we have Almighty God on our side. And so we come now as your children, but also South Africans, Lord, and we call out for South Africa and the people of South Africa. We ask, Father God, that you will have mercy upon us that you will be gracious to us and that you're going to protect us in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.